Thank you all so much for coming to so our education policy workshop this evening. I have the great, very great, my name is Lori Taylor. I'm the head of the Public Service and Administration Program here at Texas A&M University. And I have the very great honor and privilege of introducing to you Mark Lopez. So uh, Dr. Lopez is Director of Race and Ethnicity Research at Pew Research Center. It's important to understand that Pew is a nonpartisan fact tank that informs the public about issues, attitudes, and trends shaping the world. They conduct public opinion polling, demographic research, content analysis, and other data-driven social sciences research. They do not take policy positions. So this is a presentation based on his work. Uh, and Dr. Lopez is a, and lo, known to be an expert in the field. He leads the Pew Center's research agenda focused on chronicling the diverse, ever-changing racial and ethnic landscape of the United States. He's an expert on issues of race, uh, racial and ethnic identity, Latino politics and culture, the U.S., Hispanic, and Asian American populations, global and domestic immigration, and the U.S. demographic landscape. He's pure, previously Pew Center Director of Global Migration and Demography and of Hispanic Research. He holds a doctorate in economics from Princeton University and is the author of many reports and books and absolutely an amazing speaker. So I invite you to join me in welcoming Mark Lopez to the stage. That was me. Might have been me because I walked by the speaker. So, um, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to be to Texas A&M, to Aggie Land, to to visit. Uh, this is my first real visit in a while since the pandemic started, and I want to talk to you about some of the research that we've been doing at the Pew Research Center. Um, I'm the director of the Race and Ethnicity Program at Pew Research, and our work is focused on looking at the, uh, topics such as identity, representation, and mobility among the nation's uh, many different racial and ethnic groups. A lot of my work is focused on Latinos, and I'm going to show you some work on U.S. Latinos today, but uh, we've also done a lot of work looking at Asian Americans, multiracial Americans, and the nation's black population. So happy to answer other questions as well about some of that work too, if you're interested. But before we get started, uh, Laurie already hinted at this, but let me tell you a little bit more about the Pew Research Center, who we are. We're based in Washington, D.C. We're a nonpartisan, non-advocacy organization. Uh, we're practically funded almost entirely by the Pew Charitable Trust, and we call ourselves a fact tank as opposed to a think tank. And that's actually on purpose. So why a fact tank? Well, because we don't take positions on policy. We don't make recommendations on what should be done. So for example, one of our reports, uh, at the very end will not have a conclusion that says here's what the president should do or here's what Congress should do. That's not our role. We were created by the Pew Charitable Trust to provide information to the U.S. public and that's what we do is we provide information on timely, relevant, and topical uh, 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 issues of the day. Of course we want it to be uh, useful for the public so it's not just about studying just anything but we also sometimes do work that's a little bit longer in its look, such as what I'm going to show you here on some of the work we've been doing on race, ethnicity, identity, and skin color or colorism among Latinos. So let's put some facts on the table first about what we know about the nation's Latino population. The U.S. Census in 2020 counted 62.1 million people in the country who self-identified, and notice that I say self-identified, as Hispanic or Latino. This is really an important fact to keep in mind. We're talking about people's self-identity when it comes to census figures and how we actually think about different populations along racial and ethnic lines. So it's up to somebody to self-identify as being Hispanic or Latino. It's up to somebody to self-identify as being white or black or Asian. That's the way we, we generate our statistics about race and ethnicity in the United States is through this self-identity. Now this is only one way, of course, to think about it, and if you were following the news on the census, you probably also have realized that there's some news coverage about and some concern about an undercount of the nation's Hispanic population. 
2020, it looks like it was maybe about an undercount of anywhere from three to three and a half million people. So that would put the Hispanic population up to about 65 million and would be at about one in five Americans in total, uh, if you were to take that into account. Already, you know, 62.1 million is 19% of the U.S. population in 2020. And I think that really gives you some good sense of how big this particular population is. But if you notice, I'm doing something very specific. I'm not talking about the Hispanic community. I'm talking about the Hispanic population because it's very diverse. It's quite diverse and to call it a community suggests that it has a single set of issues or commonalities across it and there are some. But if anything, one of the things I think is most striking about the nation's Hispanic population is how diverse it is and how diverse their views are on a number of issues are. So rather than talking about the Latino vote, speaking of Latino voters, is perhaps more descriptive of what's actually happening with regards to this particular group. But 62.1 million, it's a number that's grown rapidly since the 1970s. Back in 1970, it was about 10 million people. In 2000, it hit about 35 million. In 2010, there was a lot of excitement about the Latino population hitting over 50 million people. And now we're at 62.1 million people who self-identify as being of Hispanic or Latino origin in the country. This population is really important as well because it's driving the U.S. population growth overall. And this is really one of the most striking stories, I think, of demography over the last 30 or 40 years. The nation's population growth uh, was about half of it over the last decade has been accounted for by Hispanic population growth. So the Hispanic population grew from 50.5 million to 62.1 million. That accounted for 51% of the nation's population growth overall. And if you add that to the contribution of Asian Americans, Black Americans, all these three groups together, for the most part, have accounted for most, if not all, of the nation's population growth. White non-Hispanics, by comparison, while still the nation's largest group by far, at 192 million people, actually saw a decline of about 5 million people over the course of the last decade. Now these are white, single-race, non-Hispanic Americans, so keep in mind that there are some white Hispanic Americans or other people who might say that they're white and multiracial. So this is really a specific category. If you were to take anybody who said that they identify as white, the population that identifies as white actually grew in the last decade. But the white, non-Hispanic, single-race population declined during the last decade, and that's the number that I'm showing to you here. But let's get back to Latinos because there's a lot of news coverage as well about what something else the census revealed, not just the number, but also the racial composition of Latinos. Did you know that in 2020, one third of Latinos in the 2020 census indicated that they were of two or more races? They said they're multiracial. That's really striking because it's a big change from 2010 when only about 6% of Latinos then identified as multiracial. We also saw the share that identified as white declined from 53% to 20% over the same period. Now, I probably shouldn't have connected the lines here because it suggests that there's a continuity from one decade to the next. In reality, the census did change the form in the way that it asked about race and ethnicity in 2020. So, the part, of the, part of this may be due to just a change in the way we asked the question about race and ethnicity in 2020 compared with 2010. One of the big changes, by the way, was that people who indicate that they're white or black could also uh, write in their origins. So you, if you said that your race was white, you would then have to be offered an opportunity to say, are you German, Irish, etc." And that leads to the second very interesting change for 2020. The Census Bureau changed its coding uh, system. How is it going to code the responses of people given these new question, this new question format? One of the things that it did is if somebody indicated that they're white and wrote in that they were Cuban, that person is actually classified as multiracial. So the person only chose uh, white as their race, but they wrote in that they're Cuban, and so the Census Bureau is coding responses like that as being a multiracial response or two or more races. I'm not sure if the person thinks of themselves that way, but that is the way that the Census Bureau has classified them. So some of this increase may be due to change in the question. It may be due to coding schema from the Census Bureau, it may be due to real change on the part of Latinos and how they see their identity. People have thought about their race and ethnicity in different ways over the course of the last decade, and that might be what we're seeing here as well. But just keep in mind that these eye-popping numbers of 20 million multiracial Latinos 
uh, may be due to factors such as a change in a survey question, the census form, or a way in which the change in the way the Census Bureau is actually classifying people. Now the census form and the way the census asks about is Hispanic ethnicity and race is really interesting. It's, but it's only one of many ways that we might ask people about their racial identity. At the Pew Research Center for Hispanics, we've tried some other, <clears throat> some other measures trying to capture um, different ways in which people might identify themselves. So for example, rather than asking, hey, here, what's your race? Are you white, black, Asian, his, uh, um, Native American, et cetera, mark all that apply? What if instead you just ask somebody, are you mestizo, are you mestiza? Are you mixed race? When you do it that way, you get 34% of Hispanic adults saying that, yes, that's what I am. Now, again, back in 2010, uh, we only had about 5% of Hispanics saying that. But uh, when we did this in 2014, we got 34% saying that they're mixed race. It's actually pretty close to the way the Census Bureau has reported the figures for 2020, which is interesting despite the census form change and coding schema changes. So some really interesting patterns there. What about being indigenous? Are you indigenous, such as tracing your roots to some of the indigenous groups of the Americas, like Quechua or Mayan people? 25% uh, of Latinos in 2014 told us that that's what they see their identity as. Again, very few on the race form of the census, race question from the Census Bureau actually say that they're Native American. But when you ask directly, you get a, slightly, you get a different set of responses. What about Afro-Latino? This is one that people have been asking us about for years, and we finally were able to ask this question in 2014. Do you consider yourself Afro-Latino, Afro-Latina, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Cubano, Afro all these different formulations? 24% said yes, they do. Now this number is a higher number than what we've got in more recent surveys. It's actually more like 12% is about what we get, but even so, that's much higher than the share of the Census Bureau's responses of people who say they're both black and Hispanic. So keep in mind that the way you ask these questions can make a big difference. And of course, when we're talking about Latinos and identity, sometimes race isn't necessarily how people think of themselves. Instead, they think of themselves according to their origins. And here, this only goes to show you how diverse the nation's Hispanic population is. This is the distribution of self-reported origins among the nation's Hispanic population in 2019. You'll see that Mexicans dominate the numbers but that there's representation from just about every part of Latin America. And of course, I'm only showing you the ones, uh, only the groups that have at least 800,000 people or more. So this isn't entirely comprehensive. But nonetheless, as you can see, there is diversity in terms of origins among Hispanics living in the United States. You might be wondering about that Cuban Salvadoran number. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting for 2020 census data to find out whether or not uh, Salvadorans have finally passed up Cubans to become the third largest origin group. I've been waiting 10 years for this, but it turns out it hasn't been the case. The, two, the reason why the two bars are the same color is statistically speaking, we can't distinguish between the two because these are estimates, uh, not actual counts. But we'll see whether or not Salvadorans have finally surpassed Cubans. I, I don't think so. I think it's still going to remain very, very close because both groups continued to grow through the course of the last decade. So, all right. I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and talk to you about some of our results. So we wanted to go into the field with a survey asking U.S. Latinos about racial identity. And one of the ways we asked about racial identity was to ask people to self-identify their skin color. I'm going to show you how we did that in just a little bit, but we also asked a number of questions about whether or not people think their skin color or skin color can matter in shaping life experiences, life opportunities, and more. Now in this same survey, we asked the census form of the question for race. We also asked an open-ended question where we asked people to just tell us what their racial or ethnic identity is. And we also asked respondents, um, uh, what do you think people would say your race is if they, saw, if they walked past you on the street? What we call a street race measure. So if you're interested in that, that is all in this particular report. I'm going to focus on the colorism report, the colorism part of the report, because that's where there's some very, very interesting findings overall. So, what did we find? Well, first off, we found that Latinos say skin color shapes life experiences. Having a darker skin color, for example, 62% say that that hurts Latinos' ability to get ahead in the United States. Having a lighter skin color, about the same share, says that actually helps you get ahead in the United States. 57% uh, say that skin color shapes their daily life experiences. 
And 48% or about half say the discrimination based on race or skin color is a very big problem in the United States today. Some very interesting results. For the most part, uh, at least half or more of Latino adults tell us that skin color can matter in shaping opportunities in their lives. Now, when we ask, when we take a look at this in terms of how much skin color shapes your daily life experiences, interestingly, both lighter skin and darker skin Latinos are just about as likely to say that it affects your life experiences a lot or some. So there's really no distinction there. But those who have experienced some kind of discrimination are more likely than those who hadn't to say that yes, skin color can shape daily life experiences of Latinos living in the United States. So the link to experiencing something and perhaps your perspective on whether or not skin color matters in shaping your life experiences. Also what's interesting here is that for the most part across all the major demographic subgroups of Latinos, the views of the impact of uh, a skin color on daily life experiences is about the same. But there is a notable difference between those who are Democrats and those who are Republicans, with Democrats more likely to say, yes, it does affect your life experiences a lot or some, and Republican Latinos less likely to say that. In fact, they're more likely to say the opposite. No, it's really not that much of an effect on one's life experiences. But nonetheless, across all these major demographic subgroups, as you can see, there's hardly any variation. So the view that skin color is important in shaping life experiences is something that we see across just about all parts of the Hispanic population. What about when it comes to how skin color as an impact uh, opportunity, how it compares to some other important things that might matter in affecting one's uh, possibility for success in the country? So for example, what about having a college degree? Well, 82% of Latinos tell us that actually having a college degree helps you, helps Latinos make, uh, achieve success in the country and not having one can actually maybe hurt you. And when you take a look at whether or not you have legal status, the here too, uh, having legal status can help you a lot, many Latinos say, in terms of being able to be successful in the country, while not having documentation can actually hurt you, they say. So when you put um, skin color in perspective to those two things, you'll see that skin color is actually not that far behind these two other factors in how Latinos see it playing a, and having an effect on their opportunity to succeed in the country these days. What about gender? Gender here is also just really interesting. Being a man, 52% of Latinos say that helps. Being a woman, 44% say that it hurts, but 34% say it doesn't make much of a difference. So gender, interestingly, uh, Latinos do see a role for gender as well in affecting the life chances and opportunities for Latinos living in the US. So all that said, what do we do? How did I actually do this, conduct this research, and what research, did, what kind of survey did we do? Well, first, let me tell you about the survey. This comes from a, a Pew Research Center survey called the National Survey of Latinos. It's our 2021 survey. It's online, done online, so it's a panel. Uh, it is a bilingual national survey, so it's representative of the nation as a whole and the Hispanic population in the country as a whole. We interviewed over 3,300 people um, between March 15th and 28th. 2021, so essentially a year ago. Uh, we have an overall margin of error of 2.8 percentage points on this survey. And note that it is a survey that pulls together sample from two panels. Our own panel, called the America Trends Panel, which the Pew Research Center has spent a lot of time building, and Ipsos Knowledge Panel, which specializes in reaching uh, Latinos as well, and actually is a uh, specializes in reaching people who are harder to reach. So those who might be immigrants, those who might speak Spanish, and those who might be, uh, say, with less levels of education or lower levels of education. So uh, it's together, we get a nationally representative sample of the Hispanic population. And it's something we've been doing for a few years now as we have moved online and away from telephone surveys at the Pew Research Center. Happy to talk about that transition if you have any questions. Uh, but now, let me, ask, let, me, let me show you what happens when we take a look at skin color and how do we assess it. Well, here too, we assessed uh, skin color just like we do with race based on self-reports. We presented respondents to the survey with this scale. This is a scale that's used uh, regularly by sociologists to uh, assess uh, skin type or skin tone. And you can see there's 10 hands here, so like a white cup, like on my shirt, sort of a, meant to be a 
scale that you measure, you, that you self-assess yourself against. And this is the distribution that we got in terms of responses to this particular question. As you can see, about 80% of Latinos identified themselves as having a skin color of anywhere between the categories of one to four. And about 15% said that they had a skin color anywhere between five and 10. Again, this is a self-assessment, and it's something that, again, is done online. So this is something that's being reproduced online. I will say that there could be some challenges with the way that um, uh, the images and the colors are presented online. So you should know that that's potentially a challenge here. Nonetheless, this is something that's been pretty stable when we've asked this before. We have asked this in the past, and the distribution looks very similar. So if there are any challenges, it may be washing out in, in overall. But for the most part, this is what we have found every time we have done this. But be aware that there are potentially some challenges with doing something like this, even online, because computer monitors can, rep um, can uh, replicate this or show this or represent it in different ways because of different color saturations and so forth. So what else do we find? Well, let's talk about discrimination. So in this survey, we asked about a number of different things. We asked about a number of different experiences with discrimination. And here, as you can see, all the way through all the different response categories that we have, you can see that those who are darker skinned are more likely to say that these things happen to them. So for example, uh, people acted as if you were not smart. 42% of darker skinned Latinos said that that had happened to them in the 12 months prior to our survey, compared with 34% of lighter skinned Latinos. What about, for example, being criticized for speaking Spanish? 33% to 22%. What about being called offensive names? 31% to 18%. As you can see, the pattern is pretty consistent across all of these things that we asked about. And I want to stress this is not an exhaustive list of possible things that could happen, but these were the things that we asked about. We also asked about whether or not people had experienced discrimination from somebody who is non-Hispanic. Overall, about 35% of, I'm sorry, 31% of Latinos said yes, that it happened to them, uh, but darker skinned Latinos more likely than lighter skinned Latinos to say that. We also asked whether or not they'd experienced discrimination by someone who is Hispanic. So this is Hispanic on Hispanic discrimination. And here too, there is a similar pattern. Darker skinned Latinos more likely to say this has happened than lighter skinned Latinos. Across all of this though, no matter the skin color I would say, it is striking what share of Latinos overall say something like this has happened to them in the year prior to the survey. When you add it all up and say, did at least one of these things happen to you? Half of Latino adults in our survey told us that yes, this had happened to them in the year prior to the survey. So these sorts of events, these sorts of incidents are occurring to about half of the adult uh, Hispanic population according to our uh, survey. Now we wanted to ask about other things too. We just didn't want to ask about negative discrimination experiences, but also, have you heard any expressions of support in the last year? 30% of Latino adults tell us that yes, they had, with 41% of darker skinned Latinos saying that compared with 28% of lighter skinned Latinos. So here too, an interesting pattern that yes, some Latinos are hearing expressions of support from the public, and it seems that darker skinned Latinos are more likely to encounter that than uh, lighter skinned Latinos. Okay. So, what else? Um, well, we also asked about whether or not Latinos have heard racially incentive, insensitive comments and jokes from relatives and friends. And interestingly, yes, Latinos have heard them for both uh, when people are making in racially incentive, sorry, let me start over again, tongue tied. Uh, when people are hearing racially insensitive comments and jokes from uh, uh, Hispanic family members and friends, for example, about other Hispanics? What about among about uh, other non-Hispanics? And as you can see here, uh, Latinos are telling us that they're hearing this often or sometimes, even no matter their skin color, they're actually hearing these uh, racially insensitive comments and jokes coming from relatives and friends. So when we talk about race, racial discrimination, comments that people might make, our survey is showing that this is, there's a lot of nuance to this. There's a lot to measure. And there's a lot of, that, that Latinos are both experiencing and hearing from not only people who are not Latino, but also from family and friends who are about other Hispanics. 
And that's one of, I think, one of the most interesting findings here in this particular survey is how nuanced and contoured this set of experiences and what people are hearing is when it comes to race and, and racially insensitive comments and jokes. Um, also, when it comes to just having conversations with folks, Latinos are telling us that they're talking about a discrimination due to race and skin color in conversations with family and friends. 11% told us that they hear that often, and 38% say they do it sometimes. So that you're having almost about half of Latinos telling us that they are having conversations uh, about um, race or skin color and discrimination due to those factors uh, when they're talking with family and friends. Similarly, race relations or race comes up in conversations with family and friends at least uh, for 40% uh, uh, of Latinos, often or sometimes. And family um, talk to them about when they were growing up, about the challenges they might face because of their race or ethnicity. Here too, you got about a third of Latinos telling us that that's something that their family, um, uh, that's a conversation they had with their family uh, often or sometimes when they were growing up. Of course, the nation has been discussing race and race relations uh, at least since, tw at least since, um, uh, well, let me start over again. The nation has been discussing race and race relations very deeply over the course of the last two to three years, <coughs> though this isn't new. We've been having a conversation about race for decades now. So um, how much attention is being paid to race and race relations and what do Latinos think about that? Well, we asked Latinos whether or not they think that the, uh, there's too little or too much attention paid to racial issues uh, in the country today. And as you can see, 37% say too little is being paid to them. 35% uh, say too much and 25% say about just the right amount. But you can see there's some, there's some variation here across different racial, I'm sorry, different subgroups of Latinos. So for example, uh, younger Latinos, 46% say there's too little attention being paid to race and racial issues in the United States today. And when you take a look at, say, for example, Republicans, 57% of Latino Republicans at the very bottom here say that there's too much attention being paid to race and racial issues in the United States today. So differing viewpoints among the Latino public about how much attention is being paid to race and race relations. Of course, race and race relations isn't just some broad national topic. There's actually specific uh, discussions or topics that are part of the conversation around Hispanics, around uh, black Americans, and around Asian Americans. And here you can see that, for example, Latinos say, half of Latinos say, there's too little attention nationally paid to issues about race and race relations uh, uh, among Hispanics. So Latinos uh, want more conversation about what's happening within the population about race and racism, about racial topics within the population of Latinos. Also, interestingly, 45% in our survey told us that there's too much attention being paid to the race and racial issues of black Americans. And when it comes to Asian people, 55% say that there is too little attention being paid to issues of race and race relations among Asian people. So there's some really interesting sets of findings here, some nuances, some patterns that uh, really uh, point to both the importance of skin color, the role of colorism in the lives of Latinos, but also the views that Latinos have generally about the importance of discussing more, at least getting more national attention to, issues of race and race relations among Hispanics themselves. I'm going to stop there. That was a, a lot of data. At least I think I'm going to stop there. There we go. Um, I, I want to say first, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here again today. It's really great to see all of you. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and, and, uh, and your comments. And um, uh, also my slides are available. So if you're interested in uh, getting a hold of the slides, I know that Cindy can uh, pass those along uh, as well. So I know we have some microphones coming around. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? I will call on you, by the way. Yes, sir, right here. Um, I just wanted to know, like, where was, like, uh, where did most of them reside from the people that you uh, have, like, surveyed and stuff like that? Because I know, like, um, yeah. just based on where you live can change your, like, perspective on everything entirely. Yeah, so it's nationally representative. So because it's nationally representative, it looks, the distribution ge geographically of our sample looks like the national distribution of Latinos overall. So a state like California, Texas, Florida, New York, New Jersey, Illinois are going to make up, in Arizona, will make up about 67, two-thirds of the entire sample, but that's about what the 
uh, Hispanic population distribution is overall. We do have Latinos though in places like Alaska and Hawaii and Montana and Vermont in our sample as well, but keep in mind that they're relatively few. It's, we don't have hundreds in those places. We maybe have like 10 from those places, but that's again representative of the geographical representation and distribution of the population overall. It's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentations. Very, very interesting, uh, as usual, with your work. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask about the panels and if you, the decision to make them surveys versus phone calls and yeah. how that might have changed the you know, uh, accessibility of a certain set of yeah. individuals. Um, I'd just like you to comment on that. Uh, so, great question. So, the Pew Research Center, um, through 2018, was mostly doing telephone surveys. And we would do random digit dial telephone surveys. And uh, we would call people. Uh, we would say, uh, could I speak to the oldest uh, uh, male Latino in your household? And if there was nobody there, we'd say, could I speak to the oldest uh, uh, Hispanic female? And if there's nobody there, we say thank you and hang up. So you're calling, trying to find people in this random digit dial approach. Um, and most folks have telephones, and that works well in getting a nationally representative sample. I'd say I would love to go back to that, but it's also become more challenging and more expensive because people don't answer their phones. And people don't want to be, um, don't want to get a spam call. And there's a lot of spam calls coming in. I accidentally the other day, uh, went to a, a refi my mortgage website and I gave them my phone number and I've gotten 14 calls today from <laughs> so I have it on silent but that t gives you tells you one of the challenges around doing telephone uh, surveys so the Pew Research Center in 2014 so if you notice it overlaps in 2014 we started looking into building our own panel so we had a large telephone um, we generated a sample of American adults uh, over 14,000 American adults through a random digit dial uh, survey. We then asked those people, um, would you like to be part of our online panel? People then uh, opted in. That's a challenge. We'll come back to that. But that's how we got started. And then we started comparing the two to see how well they work and looked at the costs and so forth. Turns out that the people who opted in tended to be college educated, tended to be volunteers. They like to tell you what's going on in their lives. Uh, and so um, uh, we've had to subsequently do a lot of work to um, uh, refresh the sample, and we refresh it annually. And for people who cannot afford to have an internet connection, or people who do not have a computer or a smartphone, we will provide that, uh, that technology so they can participate in our sample. How do we recruit now? Well, we recruit people by uh, what's called an address-based sampling design. And so we send a paper invitation to people's homes. We have a list of addresses for the US Postal Service, randomly select them, send paper invitations, and people um, then send it back with some information about the household, basic information, and then we are able to build uh, off of that recruitment uh, uh, the sample that we currently have. Back in 2018, we built out particularly our Hispanic sample, uh, and at the moment, in this, this coming summer, we're going to be building out our Black American sample in the same, same way. So that's how we both recruit people and also try to ensure that it's nationally representative by uh, providing uh, technology to people who may not be able to afford it. But no matter what, it, there continues to be some challenges. Again, people who want to participate tend to like to tell you that they have a lot to tell you. So some good, it's some good stuff. We're, getting, we're definitely getting much better at it, but there are still some challenges. That's why we supplement it with the knowledge panel in order to have those um, particularly make sure we have a representative sample of Spanish speakers, um, immigrants from Mexico and Central America, and also uh, people who may have uh, high school education or less. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Your work is yeah. incredible, very insightful. So thank you. I have a question. So I'm assuming that the term Latino and Hispanic were used interchangeably yeah. throughout the report, correct? Okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did the research look at anything with people who like find like differentiate between Latino and Hispanic. You know, over the years we haven't quite we haven't quite done that sort of a look uh, look uh, just to see. Um, but here, no, we did we didn't make that distinction. What we have found over the years, though, is that most people don't have a preference for either term. So when we talk about Hispanic or Latino, our surveys all the way back to 2000, uh, 2001, um, 
were showing that uh, more than half of the Latino public uh, was saying that they had no preference for either term. And if they did, it's usually Hispanic over Latino two to one is usually the what, what you'll see. Um, now, it's, it is the case that uh, looking at that data, there are some differences. People who are Latino, who say they prefer Latino, tend to be people who are um, college educated, uh, tend to live on the coasts, uh, tend to uh, uh, be younger, and those who prefer Hispanic tend to be in Texas, uh, tend to be um, uh, uh, older, uh, tend to be, for example, Cuban immigrants. Uh, so there are some patterns uh, to it, uh, but it's something that we found that because of the not preference and so forth, other factors are, are things that we've been focusing on more. Uh, we did have a report a couple of years ago that looked at uh, the, the what about Latinx uh, as an alternative. And we, in that survey in 2019, asked the, the, the Latino public, have you heard of the term Latinx? Uh, three quarters of Latino adults told us no, they hadn't heard of the term. And then if they had heard of the term, do they use it? So that in total, we were able to say that uh, only 3% of the Latino adult population says, says that they use the term Latinx to describe their own identity. Um, but there are patterns here too. Younger people, particularly younger women, uh, college-educated young people, uh, Democrat-leaning young people, tend to be those who use the term Latinx to describe their identity, as an example. Um, so we've done some work on this, but uh, we didn't necessarily control for different factors here, but it's an interesting question. I wonder what would happen if we were to say, among those who say Hispanic is their preferred term, how, how do they say uh, colorism matters in their lives, right? What about those who say Latino is their preferred term? What about Latinx? Um, it's a great question. We might have to do something on this a little bit later. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, for your presentation. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, would you think that your results would change if sorted by nationality? If oh. you would have Guatemalans, Salvadorans, Puerto Ricans, well, Puerto Ricans are part of the U.S., but they have a different experience. Yes. Or Cubans. And uh, my, yes, that's one of my questions. Then uh, did the respondents specify what type of life chances were affected by skin color, like education or residential status or jobs or just generally? Uh, just generally to answer the second question. Okay. But your first question is really an important one for us to look at. Um, so even though we have a sample of over 3,300 Latino adults, we can really only statistically say something about those of Mexican origin, broadly speaking, and those of Puerto Rican origin, broadly speaking. To start to divide the Puerto Rican populate, or sample up between those who were born on the island and moved to the 50 states in DC, and those who are born here, but of Puerto Rican background, uh, it's something that you're, you're then stretching the, the uh, statistical power of the survey. So I, would, uh, I, I wanna do more of this. This is something that we're trying to build out more with our panel to be able to say something about different origin groups. But I totally agree. I think that there are going to be different patterns, or at least you're going to see some differences of how people see the role of skin color, depending on the origins. I think in the Caribbean, people, folks of the Caribbean origin are particularly going to be attuned to it in a way that may not necessarily be the case for some others. But I think it'll also be different for Guatemalans than it will be for Mexicans, and then Mexicans who are here in, say, Texas compared with California. I think you will see some differences. Um, I wish we could do it. If you have uh, if you have forty million dollars, I'll take it. <laughs> yes. I'm not volunteering the forty million dollars. Oh, oh, I thought you were. Uh, oh. But 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 I would like to ask you uh, you surveyed these folks last spring. Yeah. And you asked them about their discriminatory encounters, conversations, experiences over the previous twelve months. That's right. So basically this was during COVID. That's right. When people weren't interacting with strangers That's right. all that often. That's right. So should we therefore interpret this as a lower bound on discrimination or how to yeah. what extent did COVID uh, alter some of the answers? It's a really good question. You know we actually had asked this in twenty eighteen as well. So before COVID some of these same questions and the, resp the share that say that those things that happen to them, like somebody telling you don't speak Spanish in public, um, they aren't different. 
So I, I, I do wonder whether or not, even though as survey researchers we say within the previous 12 months or within the previous year, you know, people might remember things farther back. So I'm not sure if we've got exactly a read that says this is the world during COVID and then the previous one is that was the world before COVID, but the shares look about the same across the two. And that tells me that, I don't know if it's a lower bound or an upper bound, but it's telling me that for folks, this is something that's on their minds. It's something that when you ask about it, they say, yes, it's happened but that it's a variety of things. It's not any one thing. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of things that, that for some people, they may have one, two, or three of these things happen, and many don't have anything happen to them. But it does seem like the patterns are very similar to 2018. And I'll take the 40 million of you, if you know where I can go. So thank you again for being here. This was so interesting. And my question is about the data that you pulled on the political affiliations. Oh, yes. So I was wondering about any patterns that you found between the political affiliations and the number of just like racial occurrences or um, anything that they, I forget the actual word you use. I'm trying yeah. to, I'm trying to find it in my it's brain. The discrimination experience. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. The number of discrimination experiences that each political party had and yes. then their skin color as well. If there were any patterns between those, those items. Uh, it's a good question. I don't remember off the top of my head. I will say this though, that um, uh, Republican Latinos are less likely to report any of the discrimination experiences. But even if we're just looking at just Republican Latinos, is there a skin color difference across each one of these? I don't remember the answer off the top of my head. My, say, my sense is that yes, there is. It's narrower, um, but that it is still there. Um, even so, uh, Republicans generally, Republican Latinos generally, are less likely to say these things have happened to them overall compared to Latinos who say they're Democrats. Thank you so much for your talk today. Um, yeah. I'm kind of building off of Flory's question. I was also curious about the time period. And so in addition to COVID, um, we yeah. had, I was thinking about your, one of your final slides about um, if we talk too much about racial issues related to Latinos, to black folks, or to Asian Americans. And so I'm wondering how you've thought of all about whether the Black Lives Matter protests mm. or conversations nationally about anti-Asian violence shaped yeah. some of those responses. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they have. Um, can we tell for sure in this? I don't know. We didn't, we didn't design the survey well enough to be able to. We didn't design a survey that had those specific questions to say, are, uh, do you support the Black Lives Matter movement, for example? Um, so because we didn't have it in the same survey, we couldn't, we couldn't do the important crosstab. Mm -hmm. But it's a very interesting question. Uh, I, the Asian American violence um, story had really broken right at the time that we were going in the field with the survey. Um, and so I think that the result you saw about the share of Latinos to say there's not enough attention paid to Asian uh, people's race and racial issues, that I think reflected what was happening in, uh, in, in the world at the time. On the results about how, whether or not Latinos think there's too much or too little attention paid to the race and racial issues of black Americans, that uh, I, to some extent may reflect two, three years of a real focused uh, uh, media coverage on the story of uh, race and racism, particularly as it's, as it's uh, focused on black Americans. And people may be saying too much. Um, if you followed the last election, you may have noticed that Latinos turned towards the right. Uh, I'm sorry, towards the right. I guess you're right. Am I right? Um, and uh, I, there, there has long been a, um, a strand of Latinos who are sometimes more conservative in their viewpoints on a number of issues, including on race and race relations. And Trump was able to win. Uh, it looks to be 38% of Latino voters support nationally, uh, which, by the way, isn't unusual. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan won about 35% in the 80s. Um, uh, George Bush in 2004 won about 40% of Latino voters support. So it has happened before, but in the context of what, the, of what we've been having happen in the last couple of years, it really is an interesting set of findings. Good question. Thank you. I know we had a question here. Yes. Here's... Uh, thank you for coming. Yes. This was interesting. Uh, I, my background is teaching, school teaching. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that would hit us, we had a very large, po or a fairly large population of uh, Italians in the community. And a lot of times people would dis did not distinguish between who was Latino and who was Italian because, again, the Mediterranean uh, 
you know, skin color and everything else was very similar. And I was wondering if, if you've ever looked at that as part of the, the, the problems. I, you know, that's a really interesting research question. You know, one of the things that my team on race and ethnicity at the Pew Research Center is looking to do is to do more work uh, focused on the importance of skin color among other groups. Because uh, this isn't just a story among Latinos. Colorism is a story that's, uh, that may be part of the experience of other Americans too. Uh, Asian Americans, uh, black Americans, but also uh, white Americans. And I wonder what we would see if we were to do this survey nationally and ask some of these same questions, even if it's just abbreviated uh, on, the same, uh, on the same set of questions. So stay tuned. But I think it's a great question because I do think that there's something there to explore. I have, I have another one to ask you uh -huh. or to, to comment on, and I'd sure. love your comment back. Um, a lot of times on uh, discrimination from police or with teachers or anything else, I found it was more how the kids dressed and their, mm. how they presented themselves that produced this rather than what color were they were or what ethnicity they were. They were. Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question and one that uh, I'd like for us to explore as well. We haven't explored something like that. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, having grown up in a Mexican-American family, um, you know, there was oftentimes a lot of conversation about and noticing, noting. Um, you know, the cousin Larry was, was really dark-skinned, different. Um, and so the, the way in which conversation happens in the family to highlight that skin color difference it's most of the time I think it was innocuous, but sometimes it is uh, it can be tied to other um, other things like who you should marry, um, who you should go out with, um, who you should hang with, uh, or what makes them different, and then the co co conversation turns to skin color. Now that's my own personal family experience, but I hear other Latinos in focus groups that we've done over the years say something similar that there's uh, sometimes off the cuff remarks from family members, and that's why we asked about it here, family members and relatives, if you heard something racially insensitive from them in comments and jokes. And that's where you hear it a lot, at least um, uh, my own personal experience has, has been that in focus groups indicate that we that others are seeing it too. This survey, I think, kind of supports uh, some of that. But nonetheless, I think it's a really important uh, additional question is how you present yourself. So it's not only your skin color, your physical attributes, but it's also how you present yourself to the world that maybe just maybe has an impact on your uh, on, on outcomes as well. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for your talk and thanks to the Mossbacher Institute for bringing you in. Uh -huh. A large fraction of this population is uh, recently immigrated, so born outside the United States. Yeah. Was uh, I didn't see any breakdowns by nativity. Yeah, so in our sample, uh, about half of the uh, Hispanic adult population is born in another country. That's true of our sample. So I want to say 48% is where we are, and we're actually below 50% for, according to census data, on the share of the U.S. Hispanic population that was born in another country. It's actually declining, starting to decline more sharply. Um, but our sample here was 48% uh, uh, was foreign-born and 52% uh, U.S.-born. And when you take a look at it by immigrant generation, uh, you'll find that the uh, that among the U.S. born, about half are second generation, meaning that they're U.S. born to immigrant parents, and the remainder are uh, U.S. born to U.S. born parents, so third or higher generation. Well, then were there any differences in their perceptions about? Actually, no. That's why I wasn't up here. Yeah, okay. great question. Yeah, we didn't put it up here because there wasn't a, there wasn't a story to tell. So, uh, but a great question. Thank you. Who have you found that uses the your data the best to the best purpose? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I I will say that there's a number of different ways in which our data gets used. So on the one hand, it's a little bit about um, uh, organizations in Washington who are in a particular space. So say for example, home ownership, or it might be in the space of uh, worker preparation or it could be in the space of, say, small businesses, but they will oftentimes use some of our data, including sometimes some of this type of data, um, to um, be a part of, say, a report they're gonna write or as part of how, how they're gonna advocate for or lobby Congress for some kind of a, a policy or change. Um, the other way that we see our work being used, though, is that um, it becomes an important set of contextual findings that journalists and news media will regularly use to report on something that's happening that's affecting this population or any other of the other populations we're looking at. 
Finally, I think one of the things that I really um, uh, always is heartening to me is when uh, I, I travel and I meet people in the general public who say that they used my report or used a, one of our reports to do a school paper or to, uh, to make a point in a presentation for work. And that to me is always one of the things that I find like, wow, I'm so glad that folks are, a wider variety of folks are finding use for our work in a multitude of different ways. So uh, my niece just sent me an uh, article, uh, a note recently that uh, her boss, who she works in an HR department, her boss had circulated a Pew Research Center report about return to work uh, and return to the office and was saying this is really important for us. This is something that you might find helpful in your work, but that's how I feel, or I would like to see our uh, research um, get used by many different folks. It's something about uh, uh, everybody seeing something in it. And look, another mortgage company is calling me. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Um, yes. I have a, a, a question, in, in a way, maybe it's expand on the last one. Uh, it relates to the scope and limit of the of the research as as a national level, as mm -hmm. opposed to the implications on a more localized level um, uh, regarding the first question, urban, suburban, yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, but also in relation to how much uh, going off of the scope of limits, uh, what happens when other aspects uh, related to socioeconomic status, income, uh, uh, college education, or education yeah. in general, how this affects uh, the reading of a document like this mm -hmm. uh, that offers significantly uh, or seemingly stable information right, mm -hmm. for the ones that are confronted without much, yeah. uh, si since there's a lot of perception involved in the way that this is made. Uh, yeah. yeah, I want to have a little bit of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so this is a, uh, well, it's a great question. Um, uh, the strategic document that um, um, I put together with my associate director for the new race and ethnicity program that we established at the Pew Research Center was about looking into groups to find the differences in the contours of responses across many different demographic subgroups, not just men, women, young people, older uh, folks, but also by all these different breaks that you just mentioned here. Now, there's only so much we could do with the sample sizes that we have, and uh, this wasn't designed to deliver, the survey was not designed to deliver uh, point estimates at, the at any geographic level other than the region, so the four big re census regions. Hmm. That's probably not gonna be helpful enough. We probably wanna know more than just that. If we could break it down by metro areas, I'd really be interested to see it at that level, right? But this data just isn't designed to be able to do that. It's, uh, it would become cost prohibitive for us to be able to get that big of a sample. You have to go to the Census Bureau for stuff that, that's able to do that. Um, your other question about the other factors like income and so forth, these are all things that are within the, what we did collect. So there's a lot of basic information, basic demographic information that would allow you to create indicators or indices of say socioeconomic status. I'm showing you here results that uh, display um, education, and education is very highly correlated with incomes and so forth. So this is in some sense a proxy for socioeconomic status. And you can see that sometimes there are patterns, and here, to me, it looks a little bit like a mush here. It's kind of, it's like it's not a monotonic pattern, but there's some interesting patterns there. Even so, this data is part of our data collection, and, and all this data, by the way, is publicly available. It's free. And so if you're interested in doing your own analysis, uh, this data, particularly this data set, will soon be posted to our website. Uh, and uh, you'll be able to do analysis that you uh, might want to do with it and see what you can say with uh, some of the other variables that we have. Yeah, thank you. Other question, yes. Uh, howdy, I was curious Wait, if you- Wait, you were our first guest today. Oh, yes, I guess, I suppose I was. I, I was curious if you found any relation between party affiliation and skin color. Yes, so uh, when we take a look at the uh, skin color responses, you see that Republican uh, Latinos are more likely to say that their skin uh, color was lighter, and Democratic Latinos are more likely to say their skin color is darker. So the distribution, there's a slight shift in the distribution depending on party. It's not huge, but it's there. Yeah. Other questions? How does uh, the Pew Research Center decide what to study 
I mean, you mentioned the forty the forty million dollar price tag. Is it is it based? I mean, is it based on the foundation and what they're funding, or like just maybe give us some insight into how you come up with this is what we're going to study now. <laughs> Uh, so the, uh, the Pew Research Center goes through an annual research proposal process. And in that uh, research proposal process, a lot of the ideas that we generate are generated internally. We do have a board, so there's a Pew Research Center board, and the board does provide guidance on some of what we might uh, do. Uh, we also sometimes form uh, advisory boards, depending on a topic, to help guide us in what we might ask in a survey, even though we know we might do a specific topic. So for example, we might want to do a survey of Jewish Americans. Well, we'll pull together a board of Jewish American experts, uh, people who've been studying religion among Jewish Americans and Jewish American identity, to help guide us in how we're going to ask our questions. But uh, our work is generally driven by what is in the conversation for the nation at the moment. So a lot of our work is what we call timely and topical, and uh, that shapes a lot of our research agenda setting. But it's done in, it's done internally, and uh, it's uh, something that's a, a lot of fun to do because it's great to have brainstorms and folks are there are all kinds of great ideas uh, our way and so forth. And it's also really great to see the cross collaboration that happens at the center as well. Um, but that's, that's how we generate our, our research ideas, uh, oftentimes informed by what's happening in the world. Yes. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> that's OK. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about how, I know at the very beginning it talked about that the uh, survey is given in English and Spanish, Yes. is it given in any other languages? And if not, how might that limit responses from yeah. um, Latinos or Latina people from many other places in Central America? Yeah, it's a really great, it's a great question. Um, I don't know how much it would affect it. We haven't explored that. It is a possibility that some people may not be fluent in Spanish nor in English and may be fluent in, in an indigenous language. Um, we've long been doing a bilingual survey like this, and I'd say that about half of our, on, on the telephone, about half of our survey respondents, for example, would complete the survey in Spanish. Um, so I, I, we may be missing the viewpoint of some as a result of that, because there may be people who are, not, again, not fluent in both languages. When you take a look at the Asian American uh, population, uh, there, it's a much wider range of languages, um, and to do a survey of Asian Americans and to do one that's, that's of, of good quality, you at least need to have six languages. Um, so you need to have, for example, Chinese or Mandarin. Uh, uh, you need to have Korean, Vietnamese, uh, Tagalog for Filipinos, uh, Hind Hindu for uh, people from India, and maybe you might have Japanese as well. Um, but even then, that's not covering uh, the entire uh, range of possibilities. So oftentimes, uh, many Asian American samples in national surveys, whether from us or from others, are really of people who only speak English or one of those few uh, six languages that I mentioned. So it's a challenge. Um, to do a survey, to give you another example, to do, to do a survey of immigrants, um, uh, the, and the U.S. has 45 million people who were born in another country. It's a diverse population, and we have more immigrants than any other country in the world has has uh, immigrants. Um, uh, and yet to do a survey would require many different languages, and it would be a, a very uh, um, it'd be a, it'd be a challenge to coordinate it and have it all work together all at once. Uh, but that's something that we've um, that I've been wanting to do for some time. Uh, another request. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but it, it would be uh, great to be able to do a survey of immigrants and ask them about their viewpoints. And frankly, most of the time we're not, if, if an immigrant doesn't speak English well enough, it's unlikely that they're going to be in su national surveys at the, at the, uh, across the, uh, the board, whether it's Pew Research or other organizations. Maybe if they're Spanish speakers, yes, maybe, but if they speak French, Maybe they're Haitian and they speak French. They may not get into one of uh, the surveys because there won't be it won't be available in French. Okay, so which research question do you wish you could ask, but you've never had a survey powerful enough to do it? Oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> um, that's a good one. Okay, so there's two. There's two that, are, that I really want to do. One is to be able to do, not necessarily to ask specific questions, but to do a survey and to do it well of immigrants. Because I think that the nation's immigrant story 
while being told well through Census Bureau data, there's a lot of their, their voices aren't necessarily as much a part of public opinion research as they could be. And so I think that there's a lot there to study and understand. So that would be one. It's not necessarily a question, but it's to be able to, to survey the nation's um, uh, um, uh, immigrant population. The second question is, I would like to get a sense of um, the music, uh, art, and culture that people listen to, do, engage in. That would be just a massive undertaking, uh, but I would love to be able to do something like the survey of, uh, of participation in the arts that the National Endowment for the Arts does. I think that one could do uh, many different things that uh, I know there are just limits to being able to, there's so, only so much space on the questionnaire, but it would have to be a series of questionnaires. But that would be one of the things I'd like to know because I want to know what share of the U.S. public listens to salsa all the time. That's what I would like to know. <laughs> that one is going to be more than 40. <laughs> Other questions? Any questions about me? Sometimes people want to ask questions about, hey, Lopez, who are you? Yes. Do you personally like salsa? I do, yes. How did you know? Hmm. You used to teach in a, a school of public affairs. I did. What advice do you give our students who want to become you? Oh, <laughs> who want to become me? I think it's very important to focus on writing. Uh, you need to be able to tell a good uh, tell tell a story with data, or to tell a story and communicate an idea to people in a concise and clear way. It's not easy to to write. Uh, and I have found that uh, I didn't really get better at writing until I went to the Pew Research Center and had to learn all over again how to actually describe something. I thought I was a really good writer. Turns out I wasn't. Um, so uh, I, being able to, whether it's in a policy memo, and to be uh, to the point, short and clear, or if it's about data and, 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 uh, and information like uh, numbers, to be able to tell a data story to, to, to engage people, I think is more important than just simply saying 25% of Latinos said this and 5% of uh, black Americans said that, period. I mean, that's great. It's fine. It's what I would call a verbal table. But I think that you want to be able to tell a story that, that sort of has an arc in it, like the nation's Hispanic population has been growing. It's, uh, it's responsible for half of the nation's population growth overall, yet it's a diverse population, a diverse population whose story is shaped by its origins, by its racial identity, by its skin color. So that's kind of the story I tried to tell you here. Um, but when you can do that, people listen and people take uh, the key point home for you. The final thing I'd say is um, try not to over over uh, have long, long things. Uh, I don't know how better to say this other than to say, you know, um, uh, how many minutes did I go, by the way? <laughs> I didn't try to talk. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep my presentations to 20 to 25 minutes because that's about the time that people will start to lose interest. So I stop, even though I had 45 minutes to go. Um, and I do have more slides. Let me see. Uh, how many did I say I had? 50? See, I had extra slides for you <laughs> just to show you things like this, right? But uh, you could just see that um, uh, the public or the group you're talking to, um, they want to engage with you. And having a conversation is one of the best things you can do. But it comes back to being concise, precise, and telling a story that's motivating with the data that you're sharing. So writing is really, to me, one of the most important things you could take away from your school and to get practice at it. Yes. Well, I read a little bit about you, oh. um, and I'm wondering. Um, I'm doing a doctorate right now in sociology. Yes. So, as I briefly shared with you, um, and I know that you work with global migration, and mm. right now you're focusing on race and, and ethnicity. So, how do you interconnect those two topics if you do? Yes. And my other question would be like, how different it is to work in a fact tank as Pew Research Center, um, how different it is to work in academia, for instance. Oh, yes. Thank you. Can I say anything? Anything you want. OK. All right. Is this, is this going to be posted online somewhere, too? Yeah. Oh. All right. So I got to be careful that our communications team doesn't see it. Sorry, guys. Uh, but um, uh, so um, the, first, the first question, so making the transition from, and to be clear about my career at Pew Research, 
I was in the Hispanic Center. So the Pew Hispanic Center had been around for eight years when I joined. So I joined in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I was the associate director of that and then became the director of it in 2013. In 2016, I was asked to lead a new global migration and demography program. Uh, the center was taking a turn to do more international work. And so we essentially took the model of our Hispanic Center and took it and made it into an international uh, model, looking at immigration around the world. And so it turns out the data on immigration is good in some places and not as good in others. And so the U.S. has some of the better data, I think. Anyway, so we took a lot of what we have been doing for Hispanic and applied it to an, with an immigration focus. Now I'm doing race and ethnicity research. If you look at some of the stuff we've published, though, in our race and ethnicity team in the last two years, we've published a report about um, the rising share of the black population that was born in another country. It's about 10% now. Back in 2000, it was maybe only 5% or 3%. So the share and the number is really growing. And a lot of it is people who are arriving from places like Africa, so Ethiopians, Nigerians, et cetera, uh, who also happen to uh, have uh, uh, postgraduate degrees. So it's a very interesting profile, yet it's an immigration story as well. And one of the important um, um, uh, touch points in when you talk about uh, the public opinion of black Americans is this distinction between being U.S. born versus for being foreign born. If you've been following the news about reparations and the proposal in California, uh, a committee in California has made the following decision, or made, made the following proposal, I should say, um, that reparations should only be paid to those who had family here that were slaves, so people who were enslaved in the United States. Well, that excludes people who are recent immigrant arrivals, but that is also a tension within the population about who should and who shouldn't benefit from reparations payments if a program is created. So to me, when you talk about um, uh, race and ethnicity, immigration is a very, very big part of that story. Um, same thing with Asian Americans. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but 75% of Asian American adults were born in another country. Among Latinos, that's about half. Among black Americans, it's maybe about, I want to say it's maybe about 15%. So very different shares depending on which group we're talking about, but it's not insignificant. And particularly for Asian Americans, the story of immigration, how people interact with the U.S. immigration system, uh, being undocumented, uh, arriving as a refugee, all these stories are stories that are uh, key to the Asian American experience today and also are stories that happen around the world. So all of this, as you can see, kind of comes back together. Uh, if I had my way, I would love to do paired surveys. So imagine doing a survey of Mexicans in the United States and Mexicans in Mexico. I want to get a sense of how they see each other, how they see it anyway. Are people going back and forth? And what does it mean to go back and forth? So that's another survey that no, I like. No. I think it's only 35, but yes. 32? 32. It's on sale. On sale, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, your other question. Oh, uh, working. oh yes. So I've never worked in a think tank. Uh, but I was, I, I was working in, I'm sorry, actually, let me, say, let me back up. I was a professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy for 13 years. For seven of those years, I was also the director of a research, a research director of a center that studied civic engagement of young people, funded by the Pew Charitable Trust. That's how all these connections kind of come together. And we were writing reports that did have recommendations about how to engage young people. Um, Maybe uh, colleges and universities should have a, uh, a volunteer requirement on their applications to get young people civically engaged before they come to college. We were making those kinds of, of recommendations. One of the most striking things that came into peer research, though, was I had to uh, make all of my conversation, everything I said, devoid of policy recommendations. As a professor, it's natural. My research found this, and therefore it implies that, right? And this is what you should do. And so actually having to take that out of my language of the way that I speak and, and my everyday talk, in fact, I, it, it was hard. Uh, uh, one of the first quotes I had in the New York Times, my boss called me into the office and he said, Mark, this is unacceptable because I had said something like, unless the Republican Party does blah, 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 they're never going to win the Latino vote. So there's a kind of a recommendation in it. And that's exactly what the reporter wanted. But... It wasn't appropriate for peer research. So stripping that out of my language was really quite hard. It's now gotten to the point, though, where, where some friends of mine say, so what do you really think, Mark? What's your opinion? I'm like, 
I don't know. I don't have a, an opinion, <laughs> but um, they don't believe me. Uh, but uh, so it's, it's, it, that was one of the big changes. The other one was to be a better writer and better communicator. That also was a major change because I thought I was good at it, and it turns out that I wasn't. So, yeah. Mm hmm. If you all join me, he's very good at speaking. So. <laughs> Thank you.